so many people today feel a sense that they don't matter. It's unmattering. You get out of bed and you start going through the motions and you feel like nothing that I'm doing matters. The more I unpack this, like it is colossal. It's leading kids to perfectionism. It's leading to chronic achievement culture. I think it's leading to so many debilitating epidemics uh, around the world. Um, and most alarmingly to, if you look at what Gallup is saying, 900 million people worldwide feeling unfulfilled. Hey everybody, we're back with our Cabral Concept episode of the week. I'm excited to be joined by John Miles, author of Passion Struck and the number one podcast in alternative health. John, welcome to the show. Man, Stephen, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you actually having me in your hometown, hosting us here in this beautiful recording studio. But the first place I wanted to start, uh, especially as we begin our new interview series, and I really want to talk and speak with high performers in their field, we'll, we'll get into your background and the amazing business success you had, but how did you develop the number one podcast in alternative health and really the number one podcast in all of health? Well, thank you for asking me that question. And it's, it's something that no one has really ever asked me, surprisingly. Uh, so I never in a million years would have thought 10 years ago I would have been doing anything in alternative health. Mm -hmm. But I think it was my own health journey that took me to this point because I had had these compounding issues, um, especially from being in combat, where I had been exposed to a number of traumatic brain injuries. And over time, these sy symptoms just didn't go away. And I kept going to doctors who kept telling me everything is fine, there's nothing going on, but I could feel that things were just not right. And I think it was finally going to see, of all things, a psychiatrist who told me uh, that, John, the most important thing you, you need to understand about the healthcare system is that it's got all these different protocols that is how it's guided, but there's really no one who's guiding the ship. And the only person who can do that is you being your own CEO or general contractor of your body. And so once he told me that, it really started this decade long journey into me really trying to uncover everything I possibly could about myself. And so I started to do a whole bunch of self study on what causes traumatic brain injuries, what could be the residual things that are going on with you. And I found that uh, vitamin deficiency played a role, that the hormone inf inflammation of the brain was an issue, a lot of different things. And so by learning that, um, it ended up taking me finally to the VA. And I remember talking to their doctor at, at Bay Pines, who was the head of traumatic brain injury. And she was like, it has absolutely nothing to do with your traumatic brain injuries because that would have been a long time ago and this has nothing to do with it. And I was able to go to her, well, even though I don't have a PhD, I feel like I have a PhD because I've been doing so much studying. And if that's true, then why does this research say this? And why does this research yes. say this and this? And she just kind of looked at me mouth agape and I ended up having them convincing her to run all these tests on me. And it turns out I had vestibular hypofunction and I, I had constant migraines and all these other things. And it all ended up being symptoms of vitamin deficiency, um, hormone imbalance. I was having gut health issues where I wasn't eating clean enough. Um, I wasn't sleeping well enough. And so it really got me into looking at my own health and getting myself from where I, w I was to um, wanting to fix all that, that led me on this journey that got me so interested in it. And then ultimately what I discovered is that really everything that embodies your health is really based on the choices that we make. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge advocate of behavior science. And so it was really mirroring the things I was studying behavior science with um, functional medicine and alternative health that led me to create this. And 
it was really designed to how do you create an intentional life for yourself, which to me embodies your relationship health, your career health, your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health. And uh, it's similar to some of the things that you end up teaching about your whole restorative process. But to me, it was how do you start helping people laser focus in each one of these things so that they learn that through the intentional choices that they make, they can better every aspect of their life. Yeah, that's and that's amazing. So are you fully recovered then from the brain injuries of the past, the TBIs or concussions? Are you, would you say 100% now? I would say it's 100%. And the other thing that I found that was in some ways masking some of these were uh, the doctors were pointing to these things being um, post-traumatic stress disorder. and. Okay. Not to say that PTSD wasn't playing a role, but in order to get to the root of this, I, I went through cognitive processing therapy. I went through prolonged exposure therapy. I, I did a lot of those things um, to eradicate that. And when I was still having many of these symptoms, it, it then opened the door that it's gotta go beyond these masking symptoms sure. that could be mental health related. One of my... Uh... I think one of the biggest burgeoning fields right now that I hope does continue to take off is called holistic psychology. And so what we're looking at is people using cognitive behavioral therapy or helping people with PTSD and a lot of other traumas that are real. But then they're looking at their gut health, they're looking at their vitamin levels, their mineral levels, their diet, their exercise, all that they're using something called exercise with oxygen therapy for TBIs and concussions and using everything holistically, integrative, uh, to help people. And so I do hope that that continues to take off. And that's amazing that you got those results. So one of the, the biggest things that um, you do with your podcast, Passion Struck, is you invite on experts in their field. Now, after interviewing, how many, how many interviews have you done to this point? Hmm, probably about 250. 250. So out of the 250 people or so that you've had on, I always like to ask, what are the patterns or similarities that are shared amongst these experts that we should know about, that, that if you follow these things or use this pattern, you're most likely to get your best outcome. So the first one I'm, I'm gonna share is gonna be something that people realize already, but it's almost unwhelming. Uh, is I was talking to Scott Miller, who's uh, been working at Stephen Covey for 20 mm -hmm. years, and he's interviewed even more people than I have. And one of the things that I see that you just can't replace is hard work. Mm. So a lot of people think that you get from point A to point B just by doing it. And what I found through all these people is that they didn't start at greatness. It was an intentional decision to take a series of actions over time that ended up exploding into what they become. Yes. And I think that would be the, the second thing I found is we make these choices throughout every single day. And you know we have between 60,000 and 90,000 thoughts. And each of those thoughts typically generates into what I call micro choices that we make. And yes. I find that so many of us end up making these choices in endless loops of continuing to perpetuate what is comfortable in our lives. And this inner voice that we listen to conti continues to foster this. Mm -hmm. And I find that those people who have done these amazing things find a way to put some agency over it. So they start to understand that the choices that they're making in those micro moments aren't minuscule choices, but that they build up over time. Yes into what I call the tsunami of greatness or the valley of despair, mm. because that's where it's gonna end up over time. I mean, yes. if people wanna know how do you become part of the 5%, it's the choices that you're making. Are you making intentional choices that align to your values and your long-term aspirations or not? And so uh, one of the things I've, I've, I've seen is that these people learn how to, to align their actions with their intentions, with their aspirations. And I think what so many people get wrong is they think that these things are independent mm -hmm. variables and they're really interdependent. And when you're able to align them and get them working together, it really just propels you forward. Yes. 
Um, I think another thing I found is is that you can't do this alone, and so that there's been this community that they immerse themselves into that helps to propel them forward because we have negative influences and positive influences, and they find a tribe that uh, fosters them to be better. So those are some of the common things I would th I would say. Yeah, and so let me see if I can get that. So basically, there's no replacement for hard work, meaning like you still have to put in the hours. That That's one that I would love to, to chat a little bit more about. But with that, you wanna be doing the right things, the right actions. And at the same time, it has to be in alignment with your values or you have to be passionate about it because if you're not, you're gonna give up because there's gonna be obstacles along the way. So one thing that kind of that struck me is that when I was opening my first locations in Boston, it was a ton of hours, but there was no way around those hours. Like people say, well, you have to work smarter, not harder, but sometimes you literally have to work smart and hard. And in the beginning, when you don't necessarily know exactly what to do, when I was first opening my locations, I didn't know exactly how to run a business. So I had to work harder in order to be able to push past that hump, kind of like getting over the hill, where things that I could coast a little bit after that. So how would that, how would we, well, first of all, is that a summary of the information? And then how would we use that then in our daily life, maybe to overcome a health-based issue? Yeah, so I think what people don't understand when it comes to your health or, or anything that you want to change is we think that wherever we're at, that it's gonna magically change overnight. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've discovered, and I discovered it personally through my own experience with burnout, is that when you have health issues, it's kinda of like being burned out. It doesn't happen overnight. There are tons of choices that you've made over time that culminate into you being in this unhealthy position. And even when I found my state, myself in the state where I was, um, I had had better health practices when I was younger, mm -hmm. but then as the burden of family life and my positions became more and more pressure and stressful, I think I had this compounding effect where I wasn't doing the self-care that I needed to, and then it ended up, uh, I think, exasperating the issues that I was having until I got that back under control. So I think in the same way, if people are facing health issues, the first thing they have to understand is what's the underlying cause of them. Right. And and then I think what we try to do is we try to do too much to try to fix it. And what I have found is that that's, it's a series of small actions that over time compound mm -hmm. that are gonna be how you break out of it because that's what led you there in the beginning. So to me, it would be taking one area that you find that you're deficient in. It could be that you're deficient in vitamins. And so that might be the starting point is to work just there again in the habit of taking the vitamins. Uh, and I know in your formula, um, if you're deficient in some of these, some of these, some of these areas, you'll know within 21 days mm -hmm. if you're seeing positive effects. And I think what ends up happening is you put one of these things into practice and it ends up having a synergistic effect where other areas start feeling it. Like if you naturally start taking vitamins and all of a sudden you feel better, it's going to make you have more energy to want to do things like yes. exercise. It's probably going to lead to you feeling better. And so you're going to get better sleep. And so to me, it compounds um, along with it. And I think the same thing happens in any behavior change that you want to do. 100%. I, t I totally agree. Meaning starting with your biggest obstacle, biggest challenge is not always the best place to start getting small wins along the way, which is literally, like you said, just starting to take your vitamins. Great, so you get that little bit extra edge. Then you start to improve your nutrition. Then you start to get in your steps every day. Then you might start to start an exercise program, improve your overall sleep. It's, it's never just one thing, but you have to start with one thing. And that one thing then hopefully does lead to another. Inside of your book, you talk about something called self-realizers. Share a little bit more about what that means and, and maybe how this idea that we just spoke about begins to create the life that people are really looking for. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Abraham Maslow and his work on self-actualization. And I think what people get wrong is they see the triangle about 
Maslow's hierarchy. And what they don't realize is Maslow never even came up with that. Mm -hmm. That was something that was done by some consulting firm to represent what he was talking about. And Scott Barry Kaufman, I think, did a much better job of this in his book, Transcend, where he really said uh, self-actualization is more like a sailboat mm. with um, different foundational layers in it. But to me, what self-realization is all about is really choosing constant growth. It's really that constant pursuit of becoming your ideal self over time. And one of the concepts that I like to talk about is uh, self-discrepancy theory. And what this really shows is that we have three selves. We have our actual self, which is you and I sitting in this room today. It's our actual self. We have our ought self, which is who we should think we should be. And that's usually driven by our obligations or the burdens that we feel we should be leading our life to, to solve. And then there's our ideal self, which is what we could be. And so to me, the self-realization is really that journey of becoming your future self that's tied to this ideal self that you aspire to be. And it's interesting because, I mean, one of the research findings that I love to point to is uh, by a psychologist named Tom Gilovich at Cornell. And right about the same time your book came out in 2018, they came out with this groundbreaking research that showed uh, upon examining thousands of individuals that 76% of them had the same regret. Mm. And that was that they failed to, li to live the ideal life that they had aspired to live. And it's really interesting because I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Bronnie Ware, who is very involved in palliative care. Mm -hmm. But basically, as she looked at the five major regrets of, the, of those who are close to dying, they all come back to the same thing. And that is that it's not the mistakes we make in life, it's the what ifs, the should haves Absolutely. in life. The, the major gap we feel that we end up allowing ourselves to perpetuate in this cycle of mediocrity instead of inspiring to be the self-realized version of ourself. Yeah, I, I love that because I, I think that I, I try as much as I can to preach live a life of no regrets. But to live a life of no regrets, it doesn't mean drop everything and just on a whim pursue your, your goals and your dreams. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Maslow as well. I've done two full shows just on his teachings. Um, and for me to dedicate like two shows just to one thing is a big thing. But once your basic human needs are met and then you move into finances a bit and you do okay, like you can support your family and all that, uh, it even opens up more headspace to say, okay, what can I be? You know, like what can I achieve? The problem is, is once you start to go down that road, it's then you may have the regrets if you don't get after it. So a lot of people, and myself included, you get recurring thoughts that don't seem to go away. And those are the thoughts that I like to journal and write down. I don't necessarily go after every shiny object that I think is out of there, right? So I had to fix my health first, then I had to make sure I could take care of my family. So first it was me, because if I didn't take care of me, how would I ever take care of my family? So I had to take care of me, and then once I took care of me, I make sure I'm there for my wife and then my two daughters. Um, and as they're getting older as well, I can explore other opportunities, other things at the same time. But I don't jump after everything that I get a new thought on, but I find that some thoughts stay with you month after month and year after year. And those are the ones that if I didn't do, I may regret. Do you see it differently or do you think that it, it can be spontaneity or that, uh, well, is there a way to genuinely know what you are meant to do that you might regret not, do, not doing. I, I absolutely believe that there is. And it's interesting, I had uh, this gentleman, Andreas Widmer, on the program about a year ago, and he had, the, he had a book that had nothing to do with this. We were talking about principled entrepreneurship because he started the business school that's at Catholic University in uh, DC. But he has a really interesting story, and if you ever meet this guy, he's like six foot nine, he's huge. Um, but when he, he's from Switzerland and when he was young, he was really listless. Like he was, had no idea what he wanted to do and his parents were really worried about him. And so they got him to apply to be a Swiss guard. Mm. And it so happens he not only gets accepted into the Swiss guard, but he is selected to be one of the Swiss guard protecting Pope John Paul II. Mm. 
And he said that that relationship with the Pope, um, for the short period that he worked with them, turned out to be one of the most transformational experiences in his life. Uh, because he said that the Pope, even you can think about how many myriad of things the Pope has got going on. It's got to be like being the president. Mm -hmm. But he said when you were in his presence, um, he made you feel like the whole world evaporated behind you. And he could sense the angst that I had, that I wasn't, that I didn't have an idea of, of what was going on. And he, and he said, I remember that he would give me these mentoring sessions and he said to me one day he goes Andreas God put you here for a reason he goes you are unique no one there will never be another Andreas Widmer and he goes the greatest journey that you have in life is to figure out how do you exploit that uniqueness in the service of others yes and he said you will know you're on the right path because when you are on it um, you will feel fulfilled you will feel contentment you will feel intrinsic motivation but when you're not on it, uh, this is when you're going to feel like you're beaten, like you're helpless, like you're hopeless. It could be when you're feeling depressed because you're not in tune to who you need to be. And I think one of the most important things about being self-realized, and I think it goes back to, to the people I have on the podcast, is I, I think those who have broken out are self-aware. Mm -hmm. They have done introspection to understand what makes them tick, to understand the problem that they are trying to solve that only they are able to solve and they relentlessly pursue it, which is really at the core of what it means to be passion struck. Yeah, I, I, I think that's 100% on because I've realized that in certain times of my life, I've had more energy than others. Meaning like, um, there might be a, a couple weeks where I don't have as much energy. Is there anything wrong with me physically? No. Is there anything wrong with me in terms of uh, vitamins, minerals, omegas? No. But I'm not waking up with that same get up and go, that same drive, that same ambition. And what I've found is that I veered off course as to what I'm supposed to be doing. And I've realized that with a lot of others as well, that if you wake up wanting to hit the snooze, feeling groggy and unmotivated, you, it's telling you, your mind is telling you you're most likely not on that path to becoming self-actualized or, or aware. And I'm not saying that every day is always easy because it's, it's absolutely not, but you're still willing to push through based on how passionate you are about that life's journey. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I th recently just interviewed BJ Fogg who wrote the book, Tiny Habits. He's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. And I, one of his principles I like, I think he calls it the my principle. I mean, he lives in uh, half the year in Hawaii just so he can go out and surf and be in nature, but I, he is so right, and I, and I try to do this in my own life. Every single day, you have the opportunity to make the choice of how you're going to start your day. And the Maui principle is, as you're getting up and you're arising, whether you feel groggy or you feel under the weather or whatever it is, you can set that intention for the day for how you want to live out that day. And and the Maui thing is, is imagine that you're in Hawaii, underneath palm trees and that's how you want to experience your day. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we all can do from the moment that we get up. Um, and it makes, no matter how you're feeling, no matter how much angst you have, it completely changes everything about the day. And it's, it's something that I've utilized now for years that really sets it up in a completely different way because what's the point of living a day if you're not living it with excellence? Yeah, a hundred percent. So one of the things though, that a lot of people find challenging is that they have a hope, they have a, a passion, they feel a sense of draw towards their purpose, but other people in their life don't necessarily support them in that way. So based on your interviews with you know, behavioral psychologists and, and all sorts of other people, and, and also in your book, you talk about this uh, mosquito-based analogy with, we talk a lot in our practice about toxicity, right? So there's toxicities and there's deficiencies. Well, some people in your life are literally toxic. And what does it mean for those people to be in your life? And how are you able to overcome those negative mindsets that are all around you? Yeah, I, I love this topic. And maybe I'll give a little bit of, of backdrop to this before we go into it. So the way I wrote the book is I, I didn't just magically come up with the 12 principles that are in the book. This came from 
what now has amounted to about nine and a half years of researching these high performers that you, you've talked about. And I wanted to know what makes some people become passion struck? Like what drives people to, to become part of the, the 5%? Like what makes people look back upon their life and not be like the 76%? And I started out by seeing 30 or 40 behaviors and mindsets that I started to look at, but the more I, people I examined, it came down to 12 that were reoccurring. And so um, this is the third one that's in the book, but to set it up, the first one I talk about is, is becoming a mission angler. Mm -hmm. And this is really the behavior science of life crafting the life that you want. So this gets into what we were talking about, about the ideal self basically your future self versus your current self and life crafting what you want to become. The second principle really gets into the need for constant reinvention, that we have to be a brand reinventor. Mm -hmm. And um, the third one then goes, after you've crafted this path that you want, you start to reinvent who you are. What naturally tends to happen is you start running into external resistance because the people who are showing up in your life are seeing someone who's different. Mm -hmm. And so as I was exploring this, um, I was really reading the work of Jonah Berger um, from University of Pennsylvania, and he's got a great book called Invisible Influence. And I happened to be on a walk, and I, I put my headphones in, and I started listening to this radio show, and the announcer came on and said, to the audience, what is the most dangerous animal on the planet? Mm -hmm. And he was having people call in and I started listening to this and the things that I'm hearing are the same things I was thinking about. Is it this minuscule jellyfish that they have in Australia that kills you within you know, 20 minutes? Is it a snake? Is it a spider? Is it a mm -hmm. shark? And the crazy thing is, is that none of that was remotely close. The thing that kills more people on earth every single year is a mosquito. Mm -hmm. It kills more people than all sharks put together will kill in a hundred years, to put it in perspective. It's amazing to think about that, yeah. It, it's a million and a half to two million people per year. And what really got me thinking about this is similar to these invisible influences that a mosquito has, because most of the time before we're even bitten, we don't even know they're there, or we hear them buzzing, but they're just this pesky thing that we swat away. Mm -hmm. The same thing about human mosquitoes in our life is oftentimes these people have been part of our life for so many years that we don't realize the weight that they're causing on us in stopping us from becoming our best self. Yes. And so especially if we're now on this path of reinventing ourselves, if we're trying to expand the boundaries of who we are, they start infiltrating it. And so I thought as an easy way to get people to recognize these, I would come up with three of these mosquitoes that they can look for. And the first one is something I call the bloodsucker. And uh, I got this from my friend Terry Cole's work in her in her. her her book, and she calls it a boundary destroyer. So this is one of those annoying people that we have in our life who is out for themselves and they want to get every drop of blood that they can inflict from you. But typically they're doing it in, in ways that are just absolutely destroying every single boundary that you try to put up or value system that you have. The second one I call invisible suffocator, and this is the pessimist in your life. So. At a family gathering like we just went through with Christmas, this could be the uncle or aunt that you have in your life where you've got this great new opportunity and you start to explain it to them. And all they can do is tell you all the negative things that you're going to run into as you're trying to launch this new thing. Or maybe it's that, you know, I had a, an appointment with Dr. Cabral and he said that I need to do these new things for my health. And they're the one who says he doesn't know what he's talking about. That, that's not what medicine tells you. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is something that I call the PETA. And I think people, when I mention what this is, are gonna recognize it's the pain in the asses, or oftentimes people call them, depending on where, where they're from, the piece of works mm -hmm. in our life who, I mean, these are the people who gossip or they backstab you or, you know, they're, they're just, it could be that client, if you're a realtor who you've got 15, people you're working with, but they think 
that the world begins and ends with them. Sure. And so the, the great thing is, is there are more than this, but I, I thought I would just give three of the most common ones because the great thing is, is once you understand these, what I encourage people to do is, is pretend that you're like an archer and you're trying to shoot against a target. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just go through and you think of 15 people and you put them in concentric circles. So who are the five closest to you if you want to use that analogy, the next five, the next five, and then look at it. Are any of those five, do they mirror any of these inv invisible human mosquitoes? Yes. And if so, then it gives you the great opportunity that now you know and you get to do something about it. So I want to I want to get into what we can do about it, but I have absolutely encountered a lot of the people in in part two, more the pessimistic, and I will say is that some of those people are people that are very close to, and I think the reason why they tried to suffocate my dreams, my goals, is because they wanted me to play it safe, they wanted me to not put myself in harm's way. So for example, I've shared this story before, but when I was opening up my first location in Boston. I was only about 26, 27 years old. And I had to put um, everything on credit card. I had to, I had just bought a very small condo. It's like 600 square feet in Boston, very expensive. Took out a home equity line of credit, used credit cards and said, no, this is what I'm meant to do. This is, this is what my life, my passion's all about. But they didn't want me to take on the rent. They didn't want me to take on the overhead and all the different headaches because they didn't want to see me potentially suffer. So they were looking at it with my best interest in mind from a temporary standpoint. What they didn't see was the value and um, fulfillment I would receive from providing, I feel, a worthwhile service to others. If I hadn't have said, I appreciate your feedback, but I'm gonna do it anyways, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be where I am today. So not everyone is able to say no, or I'm just not gonna pay attention to you in your life. What are some strategies that they can overcome that. Sometimes it's just limiting your time around those people. Like that, that's a big one. I found that to be uh, a big part of it until you, I, I wasn't strong enough mentally in my twenties to overcome what people would say about me or, or try to protect me. So I isolated myself. But then when I got into my thirties, I was okay. Like I was okay with people just disagreeing with what I was looking to do with my life. Right. Well, I mean, what you just brought up is probably the easiest thing you can do, which is to limit your time with them. Hmm. Um, but oftentimes, these people could be your parents. They could be a sibling. They could be sure. a, a friend of yours um, from high school that, that you've had this long relationship with. And I think you bring up a very good point is that a lot of people um, can't get out of their own confines. They can't get out of the, their own perspective of how they're viewing things. Because I think so much of us in Western civilization are viewed with by looking at things linearly, it's either, it's either or. Mm -hmm. And so many people have an issue with looking at both and, um, which is a whole nother principle I talk about. But to me, what you've really got to do is you've got to do the inner work to truly understand what are your values? What are the things that you believe? And especially if you're trying to craft this new path for yourself, what are those barriers that you're going to put or those boundaries that you're gonna put in place that come hell or high water, you're not gonna let them be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And so once you do that, I think the next step is that you have to be vocal in starting to express them no matter how uncomfortable it may be. And this could be very uncomfortable depending on who it is because you're setting a new limit for what you are willing to accept. And I think that leads to the third thing, which is that we need to see this as self care and self -pre preservation, because when you're putting those boundaries out there, that's really what you're showing yourself is you're, you are showing yourself self kindness because you're, you're giving yourself permission to let the world know that this is not okay. This is not, how I want to live my life. And then I think the thing that people get wrong is the fourth thing would be consistency is you start putting these boundaries out and then you start backing away from it. It would be the same thing as me trying to establish a new behavior I want to see with my child or my dog, but then you reward them for doing the exact opposite. And the same thing happens when we're trying to enforce boundaries 
with other people in our lives is the second we're not being consistent in taking that boundary and, and maybe you start with a baby step and how you're doing it and then you, you keep reinforcing it and expanding it further and further, a lot of times we, we put it out there, we feel resistance and then we back away. Yes. And then it just makes the situation even worse or it even makes the other person double down in their behavior. 100% and it is just about that increasing that self-esteem just a little bit at a time, which then allows you to one day set those boundaries and set them pretty solid. Like, it's okay if we disagree. I, I actually, I'll say that to people, my own family or even friends, like, you know what? Just like, yeah, I think we're gonna agree to disagree on this one. And then that's okay. Because sometimes you're unwilling to change your point of view, they're unwilling to change theirs. In enough time, one person may see the other person's point of view. And even still, I think two people can coexist with different ideas. And that, that's okay as well. That's actually what makes a little bit of our uniqueness. So one of the other topics that I want to talk about, and, and when I was doing my research for this show, um, is that you've obviously had a lot of success in your presentation style, your interviews, media, but well before that, you had a totally different career. And you were in the Navy as an officer, and you were also a high-level C-suite executive. I'd like to hear how that shaped you into who you are now and how you're able to craft these stories and, and come up with the ideas that you have inside of your newest book, Passion Struck. Yeah, well, it has definitely been a, a journey. And, I, and I, when I look back, I think it's been kind of a unique journey, but we're all unique. Um, I ended up going to the Naval Academy because I had a father and a grandfather who had served before me, and I had that patriotic calling that I wanted to give back. But in addition to that, I had always had a fascination for leadership. And as soon as, as I can remember, I was trying to put myself into positions where I could be a leader. And so when it came to that, that opportunity to pick between a civilian school or the academy, mm. it, was, it was just kind of like a one, two, three punch. I knew I was gonna get to serve. I knew I was gonna get a world-class education in leadership. Um, and it was going to take me to places from a comfort level that I was going to have to push myself in ways that I hadn't. And so I knew I was going to have growth. But when I got out, um, I, w when I went into the military, I didn't get to do what I wanted to do. Um, I had had, um, I had had some of these traumatic brain injuries playing, uh, rugby while I was at the academy and because of that it changed my whole service selection I wanted to go uh, and become a seal and it ends and ended up that I became a cryptologic officer uh, working for the National Security Agency and that ended up being one of the best gifts that I was ever given because it introduced me to this whole field of information technology but it also put me into this place where I had to to, if you think about it, really it, think about this being industries you would go into. When you're a cryptologic officer, when you're working for the NSA, you kind of cross everything. And is that code breaking? I mean, it would have been code breaking. Okay. I mean, today you can think of it as information warfare, or yes. I mean, that's that's what they are now called information warfare officers. I see. Um, but at the earliest point, you would have thought of it as like breaking the enigma. But when I was there, it was a lot more about information operations. Okay. But it cuts across everything. So it being in that position, I got to go on ships, I got to go in aircraft, I got to go on subs. And ironically, I got the call that uh, they were trying to set up a, a group of individuals uh, from NSA, from the Navy, who they wanted to embed with special forces units. So I actually, my dream came true and I got to be assigned to a, to a SEAL team. And just coming out of this, I, I just had this big picture grasp of, of how the things we did fit into so many different things. And it really expanded my perspective on then how I took this into the civilian world. So I got out uh, and I got out because I wanted to become a special agent for the FBI. And unfortunately, again, life made a, a decision for me because days before I was supposed to become an agent, Congress couldn't pass the budget and my class got recycled. And 
when it came back around three years later, I was now a management consultant and life had passed, it, passed me by. But I think that that military background and then going into becoming a management consultant reinforced this ability to see kind of uh, the broader aspects of the organizations I was going into um, and to be able to diagnose things. And it really lent me then when I went into the Fortune 500 world that no matter what position I went into, I didn't look at it as an isolated thing. I really looked at um, kind of as we were talking about um, earlier in how we see ourselves, I kind of looked at it maybe as function as a doctor who practices functional medicine did is I would see all the symptoms that were happening in the organization, but I was trying to look at the root causes. So if we, I started out being a chief information security officer. So one of the first jobs I, I got hired into was uh, trying to correct one of the largest, ethic, one of the largest hack, hacking incidents that had ever happened at Lowe's. And really what it came down to is the reason that these hackers were able to get into the system was an underlying cause that they utilized, if you can think about the medical system, a protocol to get in because they were able to get through an access point. Mm -hmm. But what it ended up showing was that there was a bigger issue with defense and death and that the underlying vulnerability was they were able to get into the mainframe of the company and how in the world w would that ever be allowed to happen? And so it made you look at all the compounding layers. And so to make a long story short, I think t sometimes in life um, we have that inner voice that I was talking about that keeps propelling us to do the same thing over and over. But we also have this inner voice that is telling us that we're not on the right path. And right. I think what ends up happening is as life unfolds, we become so busy and so distracted by everything that we tend to tune out this voice that's telling us we're not on the right course. And so for me, I was hearing that voice, but it was telling me to do something that was so 180 degrees different from what I was doing that I couldn't wrap my hands around it because this voice was saying that you were being called to serve people. There are so many people who, as Henry David Thoreau, as, as Thoreau says, are leading lives of quiet desperation. And there are so many people who feel that way because their whole life is being lived according to the external things that we think matter mm -hmm. instead of the intrinsic things that really drive us. And I myself was the benchmark case for that. That's how I was living. And yet it was really drawing me that that I was supposed to help people to break free from that. And so this didn't happen overnight, but I think everything that I had learned up into that point mm -hmm. was making me ready for when I got the opportunity to pursue this calling that I was going to have the skill set to maximize it um, when I got the opportunity. And so it happened gradually, kind of as we talked about, uh, as you would on your health journey, but I eventually started doing more and more introspection and it started to show in me the growth that I needed to make. And it led me on this path to wanting to understand more about what was making people break out. And I started to experiment with everything that's in the book on myself. I became, and I think that's what a lot of scientists do is they do me search. I did me search. And it ended up culminating in me um, writing the book, doing the podcast, starting the movement, and everything else that I'm doing now. Yeah. And, and with that, I think it's so important to take a step back, and, and I'm sure you've realized this yourself, but you can set goals for yourself, you can visualize, you can dream big dreams, but you don't necessarily want to tell the world or the universe how it's going to happen. Because very rarely have I ever spoken with someone, and it was exactly by the book. So for you, you know, you had dreams of, of being a SEAL, but weren't able to because of the traumatic brain injuries or concussions, whatever it might be. Yet, probably years later, you end up serving with a SEAL team. You get to experience that, but at the same time, um, although you would have amazing experiences as SEAL, you wouldn't have learned all those skills you would then use later in life to serve probably even more people. 
Um, I, I just find that always very fascinating. It's just to share with people, don't try to dictate the how, just dream the big dream and begin to take those actions and move forward. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily show up for weeks or months or years, but if you continue down the path and continue just to move forward, you're ultimately going to get there. So I love that story. No, it's a really interesting one because if you think about a SEAL team, they probably have in the Navy the smallest group leadership of any unit because it's, it's all based on small teams. As fate would have it, the cryptology community had the largest ratio, so you got to lead the most troops of any discipline. Um, so, and I think that was really helpful for me as I got into these Fortune 50 companies and now doing what I'm doing now, because it immediately put me into these situations where, of course, you have to do the small unit leadership, but it also allowed me to understand how you have to lead larger organizations. Tens of thousands of employees. Right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very impressive. So some of the big takeaways that you took from your business and the Naval Academy, ultimately you used in what you're doing right now. So, and I would say that it's first you moved from the, kind of the business-based mind to then seeing that I'm burning out here. I probably can't do this forever. I'm maybe neglecting my health, which a lot of people do. Was there a moment that you knew you had to make the switch? What did that look like? So I think God sends us signals and most of the time we're just not paying attention to them. And if I go down that journey, that was definitely happening to me. I think he was trying to tap me on the shoulder by saying, I, I mean, the words that he was telling me is, I want you to serve the beaten, battered and broken of the world. And I'm like, what in the heck does that mean? Like, wh like, who are these people? Like, how am I supposed to go from what I'm doing now to that? I mean, the gap is like so colossal. Um, but I think when you're not pursuing it, then these taps and these whispers become louder. And so for me, it started with, um, I think that this, this shift actually even happened before I went to Dell. I, I think that, um, while I was at Lowe's was the point that I was supposed to start doing more of this stuff. And when I made this decision to again pursue money, title, title status, all, all the, the, the things that I, I think we're drawn to, it started out with, um, you're not going to believe this, I, I was in my uh, corporate apartment and one of the first weeks I go back home, come back, and the whole thing's been flooded. I mean, I lose everything in it. They move me to another corporate apartment. I can't make this stuff up. I'm taking a shower and all of a sudden, scorpions start falling from the ceiling. It's crazy. My kids come to visit. The whole house gets infiltrated by bed bugs. Hmm. We buy a house. Within months of buying it, we find out that there's termite damage across the entire back of the house and we're looking at $200,000 worth of projects and we're out of our house for a year. It, it was just like, okay, you're not listening to me, so I'm gonna make this painfully clear to you. And, and yet, I think like so many of us, I was still like set in, in doing it my way and, and not that way. And, and unfortunately, or fortunately, it culminated in two huge life-changing events. Um, November 2017, the day started out just like any other day did. I, I took my daughter to school, went to Orange Theory like I did uh, at that time four or five days a week. And it turns out that uh, Orange Theory that day had some type of electrical short in their air conditioning system. It causes a small fire to break out, ambulance and fire trucks come, and of course we can't work out, so I go home early. And unbeknownst to me, um, someone had been canvassing me, and and uh, and I end up walking in on an active burglary mm -hmm. that culminates with me not realizing the person's there going up the stairs, and as I'm rounding the stairs, you, you have this intuition where you get this spidey sense. I start experiencing that, and at the same time that I experience it, 
I start hearing this labored breathing and I just come to this realization as I'm running up the stairs that I'm not alone in the house. And so as I turned the corner to go up the stairs, I had just this moment that seemed like my, like eternity that I have a couple decisions that I, I'm going to make here. One, how am I going to confront this individual? Mm -hmm. um, how do I look to see if there's even a threat that's going to a, that's, that's apparent because they've got the high ground on me. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the military training kicks in. And so as I'm turning the corner, the first thing I'm looking for is threats. And I end up seeing that there's a gun in his hand, um, which turned out to be my own gun. And so at that point, I have a fraction of a second to decide, am I going to charge him or am I going to am I going to try to evade and get out of there? And I, I quickly came to the realization that I have a one in 10 chance of, may, of taking him on in that instance and that the safer path is to get out of there and fight for another day. And so that's what I did. And um, it, it turns out that this, I was renting at the time that, that this person was part of the rental company. Oh, wow. And that they had uh, gone in my house a week earlier and had found out where my valuables were and that had been watching me and used this as an opportunity because I worked from home.
Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.